Uh, it's a project. I, I work I'm managing the cultural environment, the head of the cultural environment section of the Queensland Museum, which used to be called Anthropology and History many years ago. Uh, and this is very much a, a side project. It's really an excavation run by uh, the museum's paleontologists and funded by uh, a mining company uh, in central Queensland, western Mackay. Uh, this is an illustration by one of our prep guys, actually, uh, Laurie, who's uh, quite an exceptional um, scientific illustrator. Unfortunately, he spends all his time building walls in the museum and, and painting them, so we don't actually use him for what his skills really are. But the side of South Walker Creek, we've had uh, three seasons there now. Uh, it was actually found by folk from the Baravana. They were doing uh, cultural heritage surveys for an area that was hallmarked for, for open coal mining, and they came across a large series of uh, fossil bones they initially thought were uh, dinosaur bones, which wasn't too unrealistic, it was actually sitting on top of a, a Jurassic unit. Uh, everything else had been eroded in between, and there was a nice light late Pleistocene horizon sitting on top of that. So, um, however, the bones weren't uh, uh, dinosaurs, they were megafauna. Our paleontologist, Scott Hucknall, uh, went out and made the identifications. But they also noted there were large numbers of artifacts all over the landscape. Uh, it wasn't very clear what the relationship was between the megafauna and the artifacts. And this is actually when I was a curator of archaeology at the Queensland Museum, I was invited to come up and, and, and have a bit of a poke around with the paleontologists. Uh, so there are essentially three uh, key sites. Um, I'll be talking mostly about uh, South Walker Creek 9 uh, and a little bit about SWJ, um, <coughs> South Walker Creek Jonathan. Jonathan is one of the volunteer paleontologists that found that site. Um, uh, and and the, the big question that I uh, was interested in is, is there actually evidence for interaction between people and the megafauna at South Walker Creek? Um, the uh, three sites are... The South Walker Creek is, is, is at the bottom of a, a, a large lake, which comes three kilometres away is Lake Elphinstone, which is uh, the beginning of that catchment. Um, lake Elphinstone is, is quite a large lake, and I'll talk a little bit about its potential a bit later on in this talk. Uh, not very far from this megafauna site, which I think is significant. Um, what, uh, these are our paleontologists' drawings of different animals. Uh, what we've done is actually investigated the three different sites. Because it's mostly paleontologists working, I've been sampling smaller areas to try and bring some control to the excavations um, for understanding where the archaeology may actually be coming from. Uh, so we've undertaken a lot of OSL work at the site. Um, here we've got the um, palakestes in the background. And Komodo dragon. We uh, think we have records of, of Komodo in a, in a, at this site, which is very interesting. Um, Scott Hucknall published a paper last year or the year before in POS1 <coughs> suggesting that maybe uh, there's greater diversity of varanids in Australia. Perhaps the origins of Komodo were in Australia and it was a migration further north. And he has biasing uh, dated Komodo sites in Queensland too. Um, I'm not going to talk about the taxonomy of the varanids. That's really more our paleontologists cup of tea. There is what uh, Judy Field has called, uh, uh, I think she calls it partial disarticulation, um, which is a term I think uh, that book The Bone Readers really went to town about. But what we do have in, um, in the site is uh, some, some evidence of, of fauna in close association, which seem to be, these are all uh, uh, juvenile large macropods. Uh, there are two or three bones in, in a close association. So the material may not be washed in any great distance. We also have them in the context, and there's lots of remains of yabbies and, and uh, also some bivalves and things like that. So we've got a fairly uh, good understanding of, of the depositional context. Um, one very interesting thing is we've got lots of large uh, 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 reptilian carnivores at the site. Uh, Megalania is, has been recovered at the site, but also uh, the terrestrial crocodile, Quincana, um, this Komodo-sized uh, varanid as well. Uh, there's also uh, Mastoides, a very large uh, snake, almost the size, same size as Guanabi. Uh, lots of very interesting uh, reptilian carnivores. No big mammals, uh, mammal carnivores. This is the, the record, uh, the suggestion that we actually have uh, Komodo at the site, and Megalania is known from one of the sites. Now, this is one of the paleontologist's trenches, uh, initially trying to get an idea of the age of, of the large varanids. Um, and I, I've been going back to the site doing more controlled work to actually work out where the artefact horizon might be at the site. And I'll discuss that a little bit later in the paper. 
South Walker Creek 9, I think, is the most interesting one. Here's the shot of the paleontological uh, investigation up here in this area. And the shade is where I've put a one square metre <coughs> trench to try and work out where some of the artefacts were going. The, 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 the sediment is actually very heavily uh, consolidated, so it requires a lot of hand picks to get through the material. A bit hard to excavate the site. All those dots represent where a Scott and his paleontologists have found fossils. Uh, here are some of their uh, scratchings away um, and uh, some of their OSL cores at the site. Um, a lot of the material seems to be juvenile that we've found at South Wolf Creek 9, like a lot of the epiphyses aren't used. Uh, there are bivalves associated with the site. And, and it's looking more and more like uh, this is a site where we've got a large extinct crocodile Polnarchus dragging uh, marsupials into that context. Now, this would be, if our OSL estimates are correct, the latest known record of Palomnarchus. I know Palomnarchus is in the pre-human units at Paddy Springs. Uh, so generally, it's, it's quite a late appearance of Palomnarchus. But again, many of the megafauna species, we don't really have clear dates on them. This is some of the evidence of the, of the uh, immature individuals. And it seems to be lots of young animals going close to a water hole and potentially being dragged in by Palomnarchus. And that seems to be supporting the taphonomy, which I'll talk about in a moment. So this is sort of the taxa that we've been finding uh, at, at the site. Uh, South Wolf Creek 9 is the one where we've been doing most of our taphonomic analysis. Uh, these are the range estimates from the OSL. Haven't been published yet, but they were discussed at a uh, AAA meeting on um, the South Coast of New South Wales a couple of years ago by Scott. And these are the results that he presented. Um, there have been further OSL dates uh, undertaken by Tim Pitch. Griffith University has a, an OSL lab. Uh, John Ollie is, is head of the school there. Um, and they've uh, been looking at multiple grains, but also single grains, and getting a range of different estimates, which put them quite late uh, into the context. If we consider the arguments put forward by um, Bert Roberts and others, the, the extinction is in, within the first several thousand years. The OSL is interesting because it's indicating uh, a different picture at South Wolf Creek. Um, so uh, the main thing that I was interested in doing when I was brought on was to try and determine if there was actual physical association between the artefacts and, and the megafauna. And, and the way that I went about this process uh, was by looking at the artefacts, the, the archaeological record, and then uh, assessing the taphonomy, the modifications to the bones, to see if there was any uh, evidence of butchering or cut marks or that sort of thing. Um, so this isn't the best map. This is by Barrett Barna. They have their own GIS officer. Um, and they've been very much closely involved in all this research. They found the site. They invited the Queensland Museum to come in and be involved with the investigation. And they've invited me to come and look further at some of the archaeological questions. Um, the main sites are uh, here, which is South Walker Creek uh, 9, uh, SW3. SW Jonathan is around here, and then SW3 is in the south here. Uh, what I uh, decided to try and do was start excavating from the top layers and coming down to see if we can actually find artefacts in situ with, um, with the megafauna. To the left, just off the screen, is, is a, a, a Locus 7. Uh, this uh, core came out of a Locus 5, which is that's. Uh, that site there, um, where the paleontologists have found a number of artefacts, but because they've dug them like, uh, like you're digging potatoes, I suppose, they've come across these artefacts uh, not in clear context. So it's uh, not always uh, the best way to investigate a site. But um, Locus 7 was a difficult site that I started digging. I, I spent four days digging at this site with a, with a mattock in the end, uh, got down about 50 centimetres found two artefacts in, in the first bit, uh, but nothing before. I, I, I couldn't see any evidence of cracking in that site, so I won't really talk about Locus 7 because really it, it didn't seem to be a, a very worthwhile exercise spending a couple of weeks trying to dig that one trench. Um, these are some of the artefacts that the paleontologists have pulled out of the site. Uh, some more exotic materials. Most of it's silcrete. There's a lot of silcrete eroding out of the landscape very close to the megafauna. Uh, this is the core that uh, we found, and uh, Noah cell has been taken adjacent to it. Uh, I showed this to Peter Hiscock a few years ago, and he thought it was, he was quite convinced it was actually a core. Um, it was found in the third spit. 
Uh, you can't see it clearly in this image, but the core sat in between, you can see some change in sediment there, uh, sat in between a crack. So it was actually sitting in the clay and in an in a infield crack as well. So it's very difficult to say for certain this is in the megafauna units. It's not adjacent to megafauna. Uh, it's uh, basically at the very upper part of the megafauna layer. Some more images of that core. What we decided to do then, uh, in the limited time that I had, was to start focusing on excavating cracks. Rather than putting in random holes, uh, I thought, right, well, let's see if there's evidence of lithics sliding in between the cracks. Um, and this is a Locus 6. We uh, excavated around the crack and decided to excavate the crack independently and, and wet sieved all that material to see if we could actually find anything coming out of it. Um, no artefacts or anything. It's interesting, there seem to be two different sort of cracking events. The previous one seemed to have a lot of ironstone in the crack, while this is just mostly sand infield. So um, uh, a couple of different processes are operating at the site. Uh, South Walker Creek, uh, Jonathan, is uh, the other site, which is sorry, just, just here. So I was just talking about SW9. SWJ is here. Uh, it's one of the TOs are actually found uh, this megalania vertebra, which is in very good condition. Um, and we <coughs> have found at this site also a few uh, large uh, protemodon and other species like that. Uh, I undertook another controlled excavation. While we had the megafauna, I thought, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll start above that and slowly come down. It was very ambitious, started with a two, two, uh, two by two meter trench. Um, uh, got through the first bit, realized the time was running short, so just went down. Again, artifacts really only came out of the first 10 centimetres, and this is one of the flakes that we found at this site. Uh, so again, um, not really a clear signals that we're finding artifacts in that megafauna unit. Um, very interestingly, the depositional context is quite different here. It's mostly in uh, sand in this unit. Uh, I'll discuss the possible meaning of that later. So uh, quite a few metres of a uh, sand in this section, so quite easy to get through, but again, no lith lithics. So the, ar the archaeology, I don't think there's a clear signature that it's associated with the megafauna. Um, when we start looking at the modifications to the bones, there are these sort of V-shaped grooves uh, happening in the bones. There are also significant puncture marks, which are the same size as the Palomnarchus teeth. Uh, so these, there seems to be a really nice record of a uh, lots of uh, evil things going on with crocodiles, but there's not really any clear signature that humans are interacting with the bones. And we've gone into further details with the Palomarchus uh, marks. We've also looked at it on a, a more microscopic scale um, and found uh, these sort of uh, uh, striations that are uh, commonly associated with trampling of fauna. Uh, you read many um, reports and they discuss these sort of uh, signatures. Um, I think people have tried to credit these sort of marks and other sites to bring the result of uh, uh, modifications with artefacts, but really I, I don't think there's clear evidence that that's the case here. Um, we um, also see these modifications, interestingly, on, on the crocodile teeth, uh, so the same sort of uh, um, striations. If you know th there was an argument being put forward, well, these could be associated with some kind of uh, processing by people you wouldn't expect to see them on the teeth as well. So I, I think that, um, you know, these marks seem to, seem to cluster in some of the individuals, but they probably uh, relate to some other process, not really to do with, um, with uh, uh, human agency. Again, we can see modifications to the teeth, and it's just some close-ups and striations that um, we've been observing. I've also looked at uh, our contemporary collections at the QM, our zoology collections of crops that have been shot mostly by hunters earlier in the 1900s, and these striations seem to be in the, in the contemporary crop teeth too. Not all of them. Um, some of them have them, others don't. So it's, it's perhaps an enviro thing in the crocodile teeth. Um, so one uh, aspect of this, I started to look at um, the taphonomic signature for crocodile damage because there's so much going on with the crocodiles at South Walker Creek. Uh, I spoke to Wally Wood, who uh, was the forensic osteologist for a few decades in Queensland who was able to give me information on a couple of forensic cases. Um, and I also interviewed a, a woman, I don't remember if it was about five or six years ago, there was a grandmother who um, jumped on top of a crocodile that was dragging her son's best friend into the, into the ocean. And 
the crop grabbed her arm and snapped her radius and ulna, so she gave me her radiographs as well. Um, I'll talk about those briefly. Um, this is a, a, a male that was killed in 1986, and we've got nice punctual puncture marks, not nice puncture, there are puncture marks in his postcrania, and, and all kinds of modifications here. Wally uh, published this in a volume that was edited by Mark Oxen a few years ago, and uh, discussed uh, this is perhaps being from parrotfish. These uh, remains are found rolling around in, in the sea. Um, this guy was taken, I think, on a reef fishing. Um, but uh, they actually seem, what Wally was able to match parrotfish teeth with with the uh, post cranium, but uh, I'll explain a bit later on. These are possibly uh, crop modifications as well. Uh, this is uh, the, the woman um, who was attacked by uh, one of these crocs. Uh, well, she attacked the croc first, but uh, it attacked her as a result. Uh, she survived too. So, I mean, it grabbed her arm, then her other son jumped on top of it and had a pistol and shot it in the back of the head. Uh, the crocodile was paralysed and it was processed by one of our curators. Uh, so you can see it's going in the museum's collection. Not on display, you can't display crocodiles that have been involved in attacks of individuals. Um, but we, we do have them in our collections. Uh, so again, there's lots of breakages going on with um, crocs, lots of uh, just clear fracturing. And what we decided to do was actually, uh, let's go to the Australia Zoo, which is Steve Irwin's zoo, uh, late Steve Irwin's zoo, and throw some pigs to crocodiles and try to recover the pigs to get an idea of what sort of modifications are going on. And so I was given two uh, feral pigs from National Parks, Queensland, to throw to the crops. This is a massive creature called, they call him Pops. He's, he's 70 years old or something, a very big crocodile, uh, almost 20 foot long. Um, uh, and this is a, a, an adult pig, uh, called them Pompey in uh, Tiberius. Uh, I think this is Pompey. Um, so, I've got some videos, but I don't have time to show them. They're actually quite X-rated too. There's a lot of gore going on them. The really difficult part was to try and recover the pigs to <laughs> from the crocodile. So Steve, Steve Owens people, yeah, Steve Owens people did that, which was very good. Um, uh, but this was published last year in um, Environmental Archaeology Study, and I've got a couple of copies of the paper if anyone's really interested. Uh, and um, Basically, there was a chap called Jackson Najawu and uh, another fellow called Rob Bloomshine who'd been working uh, in Older by Gorge for quite a few years where there's examples of early hominids. Uh, actually, the type specimen of Homo habilis is actually thought to be the, uh, the, the victim of a crocodile attack. And there's been some interesting work on that. And they did a lot of, uh, uh, not so much experimental work, but observation in the field at the, um, in the Serengeti uh, the river in the Serengeti, you see all, all those, uh, those uh, films that Robert's father talks about all the time. When the animals are trying to cross uh, during the wet season, they've gone back in the dry season and recovered many of the remains uh, and, and done some really nice work and observations in the field of capture. They've broken it into five different stages, which we try to divide uh, up when we were looking at our crocs attacking um, these dead pigs. The pigs were dead, so I should say that. We weren't allowed to throw live pigs to compromise. Um, so it did go through all that sort of ethical process. Um, ethical process. Uh, so essentially the stage is a capture, uh, and capture is very violent, and you, you, as you can imagine. Teeth go flying from the crocodile when they uh, crush into them. Then the killing is actually drowning the animal, um, and they can hold them underwater for some time. <coughs> Not much modification going on there, just clamping on the animal. Then the reduction, which is basically the butchering process. Of course, they don't have molars, they're just tearing it into chunks. Uh, the reduction process is extraordinary. Our museum photographer got hit by a piece of flying pig during the reduction process. Then they start defleshing. Then they swallow huge chunks of the animal. Um, and that's the stage where we try to get bits off them. Uh, so uh, they have a huge... Uh, Sort of shepherd's crook, and they're able to do it that way. Eventually, they were chased by one crocodile. I've got it's amazing footage. But anyway, um, uh, what the main pattern was when we cleared up the bones, when I cleared up the bones, was loads of fracturing going on. I think uh, you can see this is all the crushing and fracturing that you see in a composite of the two pigs. I think. Um, and uh, so lots, lots of um crushing and, and fracturing, which you're not really going to notice, recognise from anything else in the archaeological record. Really the only thing that you will diagnose, I think, in the field is the puncture marks and the potential drag marks that you see. Uh, 
And, and these are some of the modifications. We have these sort of like almost hook-like scores at the end of it. Uh, Jackson's got this criteria of assessment. Jackson is an archaeologist at the um, Zora archaeologist at the uh, museum in Arusha, and has just recently gone across to Indiana to start teaching Zora archaeology there. But he's very much into the idea of how do we grade the different modifications from, from, from pigs. And so, yeah, sorry, from property. Uh, so we, we can see a, a, a trend in modifications in, in some of the taphonomic signatures. Um, so just to, well, what does this all mean? I guess you're probably asking yourself. Uh, the, uh, the signature at South Walker Creek, I think, is really interesting. We have um, these sites that sit around uh, the marine isotope stage 3 slash 2, uh, SWJ is firmly around 3 with the available OSL dates that we currently have. Uh, so the signatures are suggesting that um, uh, the, the animal may have been surviving later and uh, uh, has been suggested more recently in papers by uh, Tim Flannery and um, Bert Roberts and others. Uh, we do have some uh, partial articulation going on at some of the sites at, uh, at, at SW3 and 9. At J, we seem to have just independent isolated bones. Um, I think there's been a, a very interesting study published last year by Croke and others, which uh, was in the same sort of basin where they looked very carefully at uh, flu flu fluvial activity over the last 120,000 years, 110,000 years. Uh, and they were able to identify uh, some distinct phases of uh, increased bed load activity. Um, we seem to have uh, the site here at MIS, Three, sorry, no, SWJ. Uh, SWJ uh, seems to sit nicely around this period where they've identified in, uh, significant increases in bed load activity. That's a site where there's three or four meters. Uh, I only excavated two meters of it, but of of, uh, of sand. So this is a, a, a sort of a, a depositional uh, episode which our dates seem to match with their data for the broader catchment suggesting, all right, well, then we have increased bed load happening around this time. Uh, so um, the overall timing of, of late quaternary fluvial activity in the base, basin seems to be correlating with our age understanding, our current age understanding of the megaphone that we have at Southfield Creek, of those two different episodes. It, it's, it's a significant decline in, in bed load activity around the Holocene. Um, so... Uh, I think there's a, there's a nice model that's being developed by uh, folk at Griffith University looking at the, uh, the broader catchment about bed load, uh, bed load activity, which seems to sit in with some of our uh, current dates for the megafauna. Um, in terms of the taphonomy, uh, there are some modifications to the bones. I, I guess the pinch could be interpreted as modifications done by uh, stone tools. But I think the reality of the situation is is that there's this interesting area of overlap between natural uh, assemblages and cultural assemblages, and crocodiles actually, and it hasn't been looked at in any great detail in Australia because I don't think crocodiles have really been considered in any great detail as mechanisms of accumulation of, of bones in archaeological or paleontological sites. So it's been interesting, and this is really what the 2011 paper talks about, uh, the idea that well, we have this interesting area of overlap where there are modifications undertaken by crocs that actually could be um, interpreted as uh, the result of stone tool marks. And uh, we, we also see very odd modifications in their teeth too, which I think may really relate to, um, and this is Jackson the Jowl's suggestion, and this is why I looked at our contemporary collection of crocodiles. So when a croc picks up its prey, often it picks up a lot of grit and grime and sediment in its mouth at the same time. It's uh, grinding bone against teeth, uh, its own teeth, uh, and there's gravel and all kinds of stuff going on. So some of these microstriations could be the result of actually uh, yeah, the in vivo activity. So it may not actually have anything to do with uh, the deposition of context. And that seems to be the suggestion when we look at our contemporary crocs. It's not the same signature on all our crocs. It would be nice if someone had the time to actually look at where our crocodiles had come from, what environmental context, and maybe look at uh, the sediment context that they're actually capturing animals. The provenance of our crocodiles, because a lot of them are early 1900s, isn't that great. So that's a different sort of project. But I think there's some in interesting uh, further work that could be done on crops if, if someone had interest. 
Uh, you may remember a couple of years ago, the Kika, that uh, site in uh, Ethiopia, um, there was a paper that was published in Science um, by McFerrin and others, which suggested there's modifications here that we can claim a high confidence for uh, the, um, the butchering uh, processes of osteoepiphysins. It was a very big thing, uh, three and a half million years old, I think, so it would be the earliest evidence of, of people using stone tools. And they suggested that some of these marks, we've got high confidence of these uh, modifications by people. Uh, they, um, and these are some of the cases that were in the, in the science publication. The, um, I think the reality is, and this is some of Jackson and Jowell's work, which is in preparation, is that many of these, uh, these uh, modifications actually look very similar to crocodile damage. Um, and certainly when you look at, uh, at the evidence from South Walker Creek, some of the, I don't think we have osteoepithecines in South Walker Creek, but we do certainly have crocodiles. And I think some of the modifications from the, the Kika stuff, and there are a range of different signatures they've identified as possibly being associated with well, they have a strong confidence, high confidence that they're associated with stone tools. I think some of this stuff is probably crocodile damage, and this is certainly what Jackson and Jow and others were suggesting at a meeting in, um, uh, <coughs> last year in, uh, in, in, in Addis Ababa. Um, so uh, there's some value in looking at crop damage. I'd be very keen to actually look at the, the pre-human layers of Cuddy Springs where there's a lot of Polynarchus activity to see what modifications are going on to bones in a unit where we know there's actually no human activity here. The units are controversial at Cuddy Springs, but there are definitely pre-human units at Cuddy Springs where we have Palomarcus activity. So a nice way to test it further would be to look at Palomarcus and what's going on at Cuddy Springs in pre-human units. Uh, there's other experimental work needed, and uh, there's a, a taphonomist that's just started at UQ called Tina, Tina Mann. Uh, she's uh, mostly, I think, worked in the past in the Paleolithic at, um, in Spain somewhere. She's very interested in uh, becoming involved in taphonomic work in Australia. So she and I have been talking to the Australia Zoo about doing further experimental work with her students to look at uh, the Dasiurids and other uh, carnivores that we know are present from the fossil record at our site, South Walker Creek. We have smaller modifications to bone. It'd be nice to actually start developing a database around what these modifications look like. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, this year there's been the... Um, the paper that has come out in uh, Science uh, a couple of months ago, talk, revisiting Lynch's crater and, and looking at a, at a, a core that they took uh, with the, um, the, this um, dung fungus. And the suggestion has been, if you're not familiar with it, that this uh, dung fungus, the uh, sporomiliae, is associated, its decline is associated with the decline of megafauna. However, there are spikes in this core that they have, the single core of uh, this... Uh, dung fungus returning around 31,000 years ago. Um, and they've just dismissed that, oh, that's kangaroos, large kangaroos returning to Lynch's crater late there. Um, so I, I'm not sure that this is actually really the, the clincher that says we, we have an extinction event around 41,000 years. I think there's quite a few problems. It's only one core. I've been talking a lot to Patrick Moss about this, uh, this, this paper. Um, he and I have been doing a little bit of work in southeast Queensland. Some of the work he's doing out at um, uh, on Stradbroke Island, he's taken several calls in, in one sort of context and come up with quite different signatures. There are patterns in them, but there are different signatures. So perhaps more calls are required from Lynch's crater to make understanding of it. Lake Elphinstone is a really interesting site. Um, I think that it has a lot of potential. It's just over 20 kilometres away from South Walker Creek, so we've got a nice megafauna assemblage that we're dating at the moment. Uh, not too far, we hope from a lake that may have the potential to, um, to do some pollen work. Patrick and I were going up there in three weeks, but now it looks like we'll be early next year. So uh, hopefully that's not delayed too much longer. But it would be nice to get a sequence, if this lake can re reveal such a sequence, to match with the assemblage of megafauna at South Wolf Creek. Uh, this is some of the work we've been doing down at the site at Narang, just south of Brisbane. There's a, an extraordinary collection of artefacts um, uh, that were collected by a state geologist in the early 1920s, which he suggested were of um, Pleistocene age. So we revisited those sites, found the same units as geologists called Skirchley have been documenting, uh, and um, have been finding some really interesting pollen at these sites uh, using the old Queensland Museum records. Tyndale was very interested in the 1930s of the accounts of Skirchley, 
And um, I've published a small paper on that, if anyone wants a copy of that. Uh, it's in that bag, I think. Anyway, I might have a key. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so to do some work like this at Lake Effenstone, I think it would be really, really quite valuable. So the conclusions at the moment from South Walker Creek is, um, as yet, there's no clear evidence that human and megafauna are interacting at the site. I don't think it's been a waste of time excavating at the site. I think it's really important for archaeologists to work closely with paleontologists to investigate signatures at, at such places and try to work out what the meaning potentially might be. And it will take a while. This is, we've had three seasons of this now. Um, but I think we're getting a, a, a clear picture that the artefacts aren't uh, in those units. There seems to be some sort of processes we're working some of them down to those units. Uh, but at the moment, I don't think uh, the archaeology is associated with, with the, um, the fauna. Also, um, the, uh, our understanding of the depositional context, it's not the sort of place you'd expect to find archaeological sites dating back to it anyway. Um, there's no Pleistocene archaeology in the Fitzroy River Basin. The closest archaeology uh, is uh, probably Kenneth Kay, excavated by Mulvaney in the early 60s, yeah, late 59 62. Um, so we don't really have any signature whatsoever in that region to make any kind of understanding of what was going on with people in the Pleistocene. We've been talking to the Bar of the Barna people. There's a lot of mining going on at the moment. Huge landscapes being destroyed. Uh, there's the potential to seek further funding to investigate uh, some sites in the area. Perhaps population density was low in the region. There's a lot of contract archaeology going on. They found some mid to early Holocene uh, path sites, but nothing from the Pleistocene. Um, so um, from the experimental data, I think that most of the modifications to the bone uh, is, is the result of crocs. Uh, there seems to be other carnivores active at the site, smaller carnivores, and we'd like to do some experimental work to try and make some more meaning of that. Uh, the age range that we've got from the RSL was really interesting, uh, and it seems to match with this study by Croke and others, uh, where they've discussed increased fluvial activity loads coming down the creeks and rivers. Uh, so that's an interesting signature. Um, the um, RSL range doesn't currently support this idea that um, the extinction was rapid, but again, this is only one dating technique. Obviously, there's further work that needs to be done. And uh, one of the first things that we'd like to do is a further well, attempt to get a call from Lake Elphinstone, and Patrick and his team is very enthusiastic about this. Also, attempt to directly date the megafauna, including carbon-14. If they're really in that age range, there's enough collagen in them, there may be the possibility to do this sort of work. Uh, I've been chatting to Lucas Heights about it, and it only costs $35, I think, a sample to assess whether a bone is amenable to see for them or not. So hopefully on the way to AAA, down from Brisbane, I'll be able to take some, um, some samples and drop them off, 10 samples for $350. It's in the bargain to get an idea if we can actually uh, attempt C14 on these. On these. Um, Gilbert, <laughs> Gil Gilbert, well, that's right. I mean, a whole truckload of coal in one of those containers. It's amazing. I'm going to make one of those. But anyway, um, the, the, idea of, uh, the idea of actually trying some kind of uranium series and other approaches. Gilbert Price at University of Queensland is very interested, but he's also a bit sceptical of the technique on technique, uh, technique on teeth in these sort of open contexts. We don't have other things like flow stones or, or um, uh, stalactites to, to match them with. Uh, I think further taphonomic experimental work is really important, and we've got a potential honours student lined up to start looking at that in more detail next year with Tina Mann. Uh, and uh, what I have been talking to the Barrett Barn about is the potential of further exploration of nearby rock shelters. Uh, Richard Robbins has done some nice work on the, uh, the actual taphonomy and the structure of rock shelters in Queensland. Um, it seems that limestone stone shelters uh, retain their structural integrity for a much longer period of time than sandstone shelters. We get a lot of roof fall and collapse. So actually finding Pleistocene sites, and I know Mike Moore would spend a lot of time doing this uh, in northern Queensland, uh, in these sort of deep cave sites, I think is a lot trickier than we may think. So perhaps using some sort of augering initially or even ground penetrating ra radar. When I was at at Mungo for four and a bit years, we used G GPR very successfully to trace the Willandra Fossil Trackway site. There's very clear distinctions between uh, the different units out there. I think maybe attempting this to actually work out the integrity of these shelters. There's someone at UQ now. Um, in Patrick Moss's section, and they're buying the GPR equipment. So I think we potentially do this sort of work before we spend lots of time digging 
chill his might be an approach. But again, we need to get some input to the work. So that's that's the way we could potentially take the project. Uh, so really the, the, the work wouldn't have been possible without the support of the traditional owners who were very enthusiastic to see the work go ahead. They'd found the science, they were enthusiastic about what they actually meant, they invited the museum to be involved and uh, they run their own consulting wing, uh, Wura Consulting, which a group of uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage officers who work with their own consultant archaeologists. So it's been a lovely collaboration working with that group. Um, the mining company has also thrown considerable funds towards this project. My understanding is now that they don't want to destroy that site, they want to preserve that area, which is a nice outcome. A group of the university has been doing the OSL work and also University of Queensland has also been involved. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. In your excavations beneath the uh, artefacts, did you find A, any um, megafaunal remains, or B, get any OSL dates? Uh, beneath the artefacts? Yeah. And the, uh, no. Uh, we didn't find any megafauna in the, tr in the trenches that I dug. Um, and we did get in the uh, SWJ site. Uh, we've got a, it's quite a large, um, I dug two metres in the sand, then one out of that. But I just basically wanted to test, in, in this site we've got, I think, four or five OSL cores uh, that were taken in there to get a nice sequence, to see if that matches with the, the croak study. So, um, yeah, but, but no, unfortunately I didn't find any need for it and it was very carefully done trenches. So it's, it's an interesting way to approach the site because we're trying to balance the paleontology with the archaeology. They're keen in recovering, uh, you know, biological data and reconstructing paleoecology and all this sort of stuff, but they weren't that enthusiastic about the archaeology. So the approach was I tried to dig above the sites and come down into the you know, this. Oh, I just had a silly question. I mean, has Quincana kind of been found extensively elsewhere other than at Quinton, obviously? Uh, yeah, that, that's in a couple of... Tubes. There's I know, a, I mean, in association, yeah. near association with humans. Uh, I thought no, it was much older, really. No, no, I haven't heard any accounts. Ralph Mongler used to talk about, many years ago, he was the curator of vertical paleontology at Quinton Museum, some suggestions that were some late by some dates, but that was never really verified. But mm. No one has been able to date it to, to later. Also pretty special, right? Yeah, if it's correct, it'd be very special. There's lots of special things coming out, but there needs to be a lot more special dating too, I think. Yeah. What I'm really excited about is potentially getting some paleontological data to try and match with the site too, if those records can extend back that far. Well, they're also thinking that Quincana's never been associated with uh, aquatic yeah. type crocodilians yeah. before, has it? Or? No, no. It so, I mean, you've got a new ecological, you've got land predators in the form of these there, Varanids, and... Uh, Aquatic ones in the same spot, which seems yeah. pretty remarkable. Who was eating who? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. There, there is also Zygomaturus uh, mm. at Nebo, which is another site just a little mm. further to the east. Uh, it hasn't come out of our excavations yet, but uh, Zygomaturus is often suggested being more of a coastal species, I think. Um, but they've got records of it at Monday too, but I think that might be much earlier at Monday. Or yeah, it, uh, it overlaps in a few spots, like Kangaroo Island, with Duck Predator, yeah. you know, in sort of places that were probably... But, I mean, you can ask what the climate was like here in uh, 35,000 years ago. Yeah. It's presumably relatively low rainfall today. Yeah. yeah. So it should be even less then. Yes. Mm. Um, any other questions, no? Yeah, no, these guys are all... Man, keen to do all kinds of new dating, so they can probably beat you up later. And so okay. we'll, do, we'll do ESR, we'll do um, iron weathering, or whatever you guys are thinking about. No, so no, getting no, these outsiders no. to actually say something is going to be hard. Shallow, uh, shallow sites like this always worry me for the, for, for um, luminescence because you've got surface disturb disturbance by um, soil biota, tree throw, and yeah. so on. And it strikes me the sooner you get some direct ages on the bone material, mm. the more comfortable I feel about the chronology. Yeah, yeah. And there is a bit of cracking going on we've identified in the site. So there's, there is vertical displacement of lithic, so there is probably vertical displacement of sediment too. But, and that's, that should be a part of the The paleontologists are really running the, the dating side of it, so... Yeah. But would your single grain dates resolve that problem? Uh, that was the, the, the thought, um, and there doesn't seem to be that much mixing in the samples we've got so far. All this is to be published a bit like, 
when Scott decides it's time to publish this. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question, Dave, and that's why we've tried the different sorts of techniques with um, Tim Peach.